Hi, I'm Dr. Sheila Reyes, a rheumatologist from the Philippines, reporting for Room Now at the virtual ACR 2021. Joining me today is Dr. Larega Gupta, Assistant Professor of Rheumatology and Clinical Immunology at Lucknow, India, but currently based in the UK, to talk about the COVID-19 vaccination in autoimmune disease, or the COVAD study, an interim analysis of safety in idiopathic inflammatory myopathies from a large multi-center global survey presented on Saturday during the abstract session. Hello, Dr. Gupta. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Sheila. It's truly an honor to be here and absolutely lovely to see you. Thank you so much. All right. So I'll jump into, into some of my questions already. So the COVID study had an impressive number of respondents. Can you give us a brief background of how it all started? Probably a brief um, methodology as well. Yeah, uh, to be honest, uh, this started out just as a tiny question which our patients asked, uh, doctor, should I really take the vaccine? So I was running a myositis clinic back home in Lucknow and often these patients would come and widespread hesitancy, you know, uh, in India, the vaccination rates were lagging far behind the rest of the world. And then um, uh, I asked my mentor, Dr. Agarwal, uh, what do we do about this? What are you doing with your patients? What are you telling them? And he was like, yeah, really, I have nothing to tell them. I just tell them you should get vaccinated, but we don't really know uh, what to do. And how do we answer this question? Because those were difficult times when India was going to the second wave and vaccination had just begun. So we thought, okay, the best way might be just to ask the patients themselves. Let's, let's ask those people who got vaccinated if they experienced any adverse events. And then maybe that should answer the question. So we thought, okay, so there are lockdowns in various countries, maybe a self-report electronic service should be good to go. And uh, so that's how we ended up listing those questions. Then you realize, okay, surveys need pilot testing and validation. So all those uh, routine steps followed. And uh, now the big question was, how do we reach out to all these patients? So we uh, thought, okay, let's approach some of our fellow rheumatologists and um, who can maybe, maybe make patients aware of uh, this study. And um, yeah, then we needed control groups. So ended up approaching neurologists and, and internists. So gradually this uh, self-report electronic survey, it ended up being like a large study with like over hundred collaborators who very kindly helped us with this um, responses. And uh, mainly we tried to classify all the adverse events into four broad categories, like injection side pain, which was very, very common. Then the minor ADRs, you know, minor adverse events, which were like not so trouble, not so troubling, you know, just, just minor rashes, fever, aches and pains. And then the more severe rashes and, and uh, other adverse events and hospitalizations. And then uh, we set out to analyze the data and ended up with this. The rest is all history. Okay, that was that was really a very impressive feat that you know you were able to accomplish in such a short period of time. Really, um, given given that everything's been virtual, right? I presume everything's online, and what you've been doing, the collaborations, it's all it's all virtual. It's all online, right? Yeah, I think it really testifies to the true power of social media and how connected we are as a world. Yeah, you know, rheumatologists around the world um, all coming together and these patient support groups. I think they're truly powerful in terms of the change they can bring to their own lives by now helping with research in real time and all that data. So this study really uh, is the best example of that. Yeah, good. So um, could, you, could you kindly share some of the significant findings that, that um, was seen in your study? Yes, yeah, so um, I wouldn't want to miss anything. So let me quickly pull out my slides. And yes, so, so uh, for this uh, ASIAR abstract, we had analyzed uh, the complete responses from patients because I'm wearing complete responses. So around nearly 10,000 responses and uh, of these uh, nearly 1,200 were myositis patients and 4,000 being competitors, that is autoimmune diseases and over 5,000 healthy controls. So our patient population was um, distributed all around the world, but the largest number of respondents were from the United States, UK, India, Mexico, and Turkey. So uh, 
And uh, most of the myositis patients were based out of the United States. The, um, and uh, dermatomyositis was the most common type and 69% were fully vaccinated. And uh, Pfizer emerged as the most common type of vaccine taken, nearly 40% had taken Pfizer. And then there was AstraZeneca and, and Sewers and Covishield put together. So um, we found that minor adverse events, they were fairly common. So as we would expect, like nearly 75% patients and also healthy controls uh, experienced minor ADRs, but severe adverse events, uh, the major adverse events put together, they were seen in 5%, but hospitalizations were rare uh, to the tune of like 0.6%. And uh, then we set out to analyze the various groups, that is myositis, autoimmune disease, and healthy control. So there were trends to um, increase adverse events, particularly the major ADRs and uh, hospitalizations in IIM. But then we weren't sure because, you know, there's so much heterogeneity within myositis. Yeah. And, and then we have like difference in, you know, the age profile, gender distribution, type of vaccine taken, region. So we tried to conduct an adjusted analysis accounting for these factors, also the underlying immunosuppression. And after that, the only difference which actually remained was rashes. So myositis mm -hmm. patients are only predisposed to more rashes, but then, you know, even in general, myositis is predisposed to rashes and myositis is the most common type in our group. So we do expect that somewhere. And... Um, it was interesting to see actually that there was some difference in between dermatomyositis and IBM. So uh, patients with DM and, and overlap myositis, they experience rashes more often. And IBM, uh, most of the adverse events were actually less common. So this is you know akin to what we would expect based on disease pathogenesis as well, like and the patient profile in general. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, overall, if you were to ask me, um, I'd say that vaccination would appear to be like rather safe in these patients. You know, the absolute risk of major adverse events, it's not very large. And hospitalizations are rare, just like 0.6%. Even 0.2% of healthy controls were hospitalized after vaccination. So I'd say the study is overall very reassuring and myositis patients should take the vaccine. Yeah, and, I agree. It, yeah. Sorry, continue. No, no, please go ahead. Okay. So yeah, I agree that it's very reassuring. And at least this time you would, um, if, if, if a myositis patient would ask if vaccination is um, safe, then you would be more confident in giving more evidence that it is, right? Um, so, so in relation to that, um, what do you think, because your results have been really um, important as well, so what do you think will be the significance or the impact of these findings in improving the management of patients with IIM? So I think this uh, study only answers part of the question because we looked at the short-term adverse events, really, this was seven-day adverse events. But I'd be more interested in knowing, you know, whether these patients actually develop um, flares after vaccination yeah. and what are the long-term outcomes. So we do hope to address those questions. Um, and so we would be conducting another survey soon, which would look at the long-term adverse events after vaccination. We have captured the physical function of most of these patients at the first visit, like the first uh, response. And we hope to look at their physical function at six months after the vaccination. That will truly answer because there are some concerns being raised, but you know, there have been several reports. We've seen case reports. Mm -hmm. I've seen class in my own patients at times. We don't know really. We need systematic studies to know if these were actually triggered by vaccination or just yeah. in general. But there have been reports of even post-COVID myositis like flares. And uh, so to this effect, we were really curious to you know, dig deeper and understand what is really happening there. So we did uh, conduct another study as well on a different database. So that was based on a Trinitex which is physician-reported adverse events. And you'd be surprised to know that uh, the results came down to the same thing roughly like 0.2% hospitalizations and um, the absolute risk being very small. And there we did find something very interesting. So we also uh, could look at 60 day outcomes after vaccination. Oh. So what we did was we clubbed together all the special adverse events of interest, like um, all the autoimmune and thrombotic events and, and inflammatory events like myocarditis, myositis, demyelinating events, um, myocardial infarction, CVA, all of them clubbed together. 
So these special adverse events of interest were actually higher in dermatomyositis at 60 days after vaccination compared to the non-DM group. So again, the absolute risk was very small. I would say that it is still very, very reassuring considering in that large patient cohort of you know, more than 5,000 individuals, we put together everything and still the absolute risk was very small, very reassuring, but also at the same time, believer in science. So we all would want to you know, dig deeper and see what happens yeah. in the future. Yeah, that's, yeah, that would be very good. So before I wrap up, um... Were, did you have any data on like outcomes of uh, those who had COVID infection among the IIMs or like how about breakthrough infections as well? Yeah, I, I know what you mean because this was something even I was very curious about like to start with. And, and in my cohort, I noticed uh, two or three patients, you know, whose family turned positive, but they did not. And it was, uh, I was really curious as to what's really happening. And when we had the COVID data, that was the first thing I wanted to dig deeper into. And uh, we saw that COVID positivity was actually reported less often by myositis patients. So the odds ratio was like 0.4 versus autoimmune disease as well as healthy controls, which was very surprising. Now uh, we looked at the symptom profile, uh, which was largely similar, but you know, the hospitalizations and oxygenation, oxygen requirement was actually higher, more frequent. So it seems like uh, the symptoms and maybe even COVID positivity, it might be sometimes, you know, um, may not emerge early on because of immunosuppression, because when we adjusted for glucocorticoid exposure, then there was actually no difference. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, they're exposed to high doses of steroids and probably the symptoms are masked. And, uh, uh, and we also identified certain groups which were associated with worse outcomes. So particularly patients who had either underlying interstitial lung disease or uh, men, African-Americans. And um, yeah, and also those who were on uh, uh, steroids and immunosuppressants. So yeah, okay. they had high risk of severe COVID as well as sepsis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we're looking forward to, to the additional um, results of your um of your the new phase i guess of your study which um will i guess will be recruiting soon right um yeah. yeah okay so we're we're really looking forward to that probably in the next year's acr that would be another um abstract session presentation <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah hopefully before that <laughs> oh yeah hopefully before that Okay, so um, this has been a very engaging discussion. And again, I would like to thank Dr. Latika Gupta for sharing her time with us. Latika, I hope um, we get to see you again and here thanks, at Sheila. Room Now. <laughs> yes, thanks, Sheila. Lovely meeting you. Okay. All Goodbye. right. So, <laughs> okay, so um, once again, I'm Sheila Reyes. Follow me on Twitter at Roomarampa and tune in through roomnow.com for more coverage of the ACR Convergence 2021. Thank you.